So Gary, while we've got you here, I wanted to talk to you about writing, how you broke into journalism and then how you've made this kind of transition through all these different forms of media as well. Like, what's that journey been like? I've been really, really, really fortunate in that the the two things that I loved growing up as a kid, I got to do them both professionally. I had careers mm. in both. Uh, I grew up loving video games and I grew up loving films. And um, I left school at 15. I hated school, couldn't wait to get out. Mm. Um, and the only thing I was ever good at or interested in at school was writing. English was the only thing I ever really enjoyed doing. Um, I was terrible at maths, terrible at everything. I r forgot half this. I'd spent four years learning French and German. I can't, don't speak a word of it now. Yeah. And I can't remember any of it. So most of what I learned at school went to waste, but I was always very interested in English and I would do extra, I would write little short stories in school and got a reputation as a bit of an apple polisher for my English teacher because I did extra work, just because I enjoyed doing it. Yeah. And then and I couldn't wait to get out and I was playing video games uh, and I used to read Commodore User and Zap64 and these magazines that I used to enjoy. And I started writing my own game reviews and at 15 got an interview at Commodore User to go and be a, 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 a freelance game reviewer for them. Mm. And went and I was literally doing my GCSEs in the morning and then going into Commodore User's office and writing game reviews in the afternoon. And awesome. as soon as I was done with my exams, I went and got, I had a staff job at Commodore User. And then from there, worked on a magazine called The One for 16-Bit Games, and then computer, computer Video Games, what later became CVG, mm -hmm. um, and worked for a long time in the game industry on in the UK. Uh, went to Future Publishing, helped launch the original UK version of PC Gamer, and then three years later when they launched an American version, they asked me to come out and kind of look after it. Oh, cool. And I did that um, partly because it seemed like it would be a fun thing to do, like a year in America, but also yeah. because I was secretly like, my what I really wanted to do was write movies. And I thought, well, that will get me that much closer. closer. And because it's changed a little bit now, but mm. when I was a kid, it was the idea of writing the kind of stuff that I loved, like Star Wars, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, even stupid shit like Knight Rider. Mm. You know, all the, I grew up on all the Glenn A. Larson shows and I loved yeah. those shows. And just genre, just fun stuff. And I used to I used to read, you know, Douglas Adams and all kinds of science fiction growing up and I loved all of it. And I wanted to do that. But beyond like Doctor Who and Blake Seven, there's nothing like that on British. There's a weird kind of snobbery yeah. towards it and still is today, I think. Like Doctor Who is the number one show that the BBC has. It's their biggest, I think alongside Top Gear, is like their biggest global export. Yeah. But the reality is I think the people at the BBC are kind of embarrassed by it. They would much rather be making Wolf Hall and, you know, fancy costume dramas and, yeah. um, you know, what, what they consider real drama. And I think there's a weird institutional bias towards science fiction and fantasy and anything genre, anything that might actually entertain an audience is a weird kind of bias against it and so i thought well if i want to make the stuff that i want to make it's yeah. just not going to happen here in the uk i'd rather just go where that stuff is the norm mm. so I, i'll try and break into hollywood and so going to america was like half of that and then i worked on a on a on a uh, the american version of total film magazine for a mm. while and then what happened was in the year 2000 there was a big dot-com crash and a lot of my the company i worked for lost a lot of money laid a ton of people off and I had, I got some redundancy money and I had about a year. Mm. Uh, if I li basically just lived on, you know, pot noodles for a year, I could, and, and like the cheapest, lived as frugally as possible. I could live for about a year without actually having to do any work, like paid work. That's the dream right there. Well, it's, it's <laughs> not quite as glad, not quite as fun as you might imagine sitting around in your underpants eating pot noodles and trying to think <laughs> of film ideas. But I, I always said to myself when I was working in games magazines, I, mm. I would try to, do the film thing as a sideline, but I just, who has the time? You don't get time, no. Yeah. And then suddenly I've got all the time in the world. So I was sitting around and I thought, okay, well, I had the ideas for films that I wanted to write, but I'd never actually sat down and really done it. Mm. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I wrote over the course of a year, I think five or six different feature film scripts just as kind of a learning, just like I, I'm kind of much more of an autodidact than I am someone who like, I don't learn very well from books right. or from being taught things. And I actually think there's a, there's a very um, uh, somewhat disingenuous culture of read this uh, teachers and books that promise to, to teach you the formula of writing a hit film, yeah. which is all bollocks. A lot of it is nonsense. No one knows the formula to write a hit film. Yeah. And if I and if they do, trust me, there's much more money to be made writing hit films than there is writing books about how to write hit films. So, um, 
a lot of these people are complete charlatans and frauds. And I always think that for me, the best way to learn was just to absorb and consume by osmosis as much as possible. So I would watch a lot of films anyway, read a lot of film scripts, which is, was hard to do back in the day because this is before the internet was fully what it is now and it yeah. was hard to find film scripts. Now it's really, really, one of the great advantages is it's really, really easy to go onto the web and find the you know, movie scripts of you know great movies. You can go find the scripts for all the Oscar movies this year. Like if your favorite, pick your favorite movie. You can go find it. You can find the script of the book. If you like, you can find yeah. all these scripts are out there. Um, and for me, I just read those. I was like, okay, look at what they do, and basically try and learn from them. And so I read a lot of scripts and wrote a bunch of my own. And each one was slightly less terrible than the last until I finally found, finally wrote one that was, I th wouldn't be embarrassed to show someone. And I sent it off to a bunch of agents and managers, and you you, you can find lists that will sh that will um, uh, resources that will give you lists of people that accept unsolicited queries. Okay. Like you can't just send your script to CAA; they will yeah. send it back to you unopened. They don't just accept scripts from anyone. But there are management companies and producers that are always on the lookout for new material and will read your script. Mm. And I sent it to a bunch of those, and uh, there was a management company that liked it and signed me as a writer. Yeah, and. Um, wrote another script after that, which was the first thing that I kind of got optioned by a production company and then kind of jobbed around for a long time in the kind of the minor leagues of the film writing business, just working on little films. Like there's a really bad uh, Jason Statham, Jet Li film called War that I worked on okay. where I wrote some of the dialogue for that. And like, I don't have a credit on the film or anything because <laughs> when you come in and like just fix little things, you generally don't. Yeah. But I did some work on that. Got to hang out with Statham. He gave me a ride in the transporter car. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that, was cool. my best, that was my best story from working on that film. That's um, worth it. Just yeah, that was, that was, that was the, mm. the good thing that came out of it. Um, and then I wrote Eli as a spec and we sold that. And then once you sell like an actual film to a studio and it gets someone like Denzel Washington attached, suddenly all these doors that you didn't know existed before open to you and people want to come and talk to you about working on bigger films. Yeah. So from that, I got to work. I worked on the Warcraft movie. Uh, I worked on Akira, uh, which I don't think is ever going to be made, but Warner <laughs> Brothers keeps trying to make it. has been like six writers on it since me. Yeah. Um, and I've worked on a bunch of other films. I did the Will Smith movie, After Earth, um, and then Star Wars. And I've been working on, you know, I've, I've also been doing the game stuff as, as well. It's been really, really interesting that not just kind of going from games and into films. Yeah. As I kind of transitioned from that, as someone who now is a film writer, but has a legitimate background in video games because they did it for 20 years. Yeah. Just as I was doing that, we were seeing, we talked about this earlier, kind of the maturity of games, where now games are trying to figure out how to tell better stories. Yeah. And so someone coming from a games background who now works in storytelling, people would come to me and say, can you help us do this? So I, I've worked on a bunch of different video games um, most n most well known probably the war the first season of The Walking Dead that Telltale did. Yeah. I was a story consultant on that and wrote one of the five episodes and that was really well received. That's a huge thing. Like everyone loved that. It was like top. Yeah, of it was really list. kind of yeah. a watershed moment I think in people because mm. Telltale Games a few years ago used to be just kind of this scrappy little company that made yeah. like strong bad and Sam and Max games and now they're one of the biggest developers. You know, they're exactly, doing Game yeah. of Thrones and Walking Dead and they're doing a Minecraft you know narrative yeah. game and they're this you know suddenly they're this huge deal and that was all off the success of. The Walking Dead and what happened yeah. after that was a lot of game companies I think woke up to again we talked about this before like back in the day when a video game came out you go well the story's crappy but like who cares it's a video game yeah. you can't get away with that anymore if no. you have a game that has a story and the story's no good you'll get dinged for that and rightly so because the expectation now for off the back of the work of companies like Naughty Dog and, and Bungie and Bioware and Telltale yeah. has created a higher expectation for how good a story is told in a video game. Definitely, and when a yeah. story is crappy or a story's not there, you miss it now because yeah. we've played other games. And Journey's another, Journey's another game that does beautiful storytelling. Yeah. Um, so off the back of that, I ended up consulting on a lot of different video games. So it's actually kind of fun for me that I get That's to cool. do what I like to do now, but in yeah. a medium that I still... Because I still play all the games. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a long-winded answer to have you, what have, happened. Have you got any tips for aspiring screenwriters then? Um, you know, it's really interesting. You, you know, you were saying earlier, like you, there's always that question of like, how do you get into the games journalism business? And mm. it, there's no real way in. Like you don't go to games journalism school. You know, you just know a lot about games and love them. And hopefully you can write a little bit as well. Yeah. And, you know, you'd kind of learn the rest along the way. Um, and I think the same is true of film. Like you can, of course, go to film school. 
worked for George Lucas, worked for Brian De Palma and, you know, Spielberg and all these great filmmakers. But for every filmmaker that I know working in the business who went to film school, I know another one who just kind of learned by doing and just made their own films in their back garden and, and just kind of did it their own yeah. way. So you, there's no, you know, route one into films. I, I think this is true with any kind of creative endeavor. I mean, J.K. Rowling just wrote, you know, sat in a train station and wrote the Harry Potter books and yeah. was rejected by like 30 different publishers. Can you imagine if you're one of the publishers that turned down Harry horrible, Potter? Horrible, wouldn't it? How do you ever live that down? Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is to, there's a great website that has all the rejection letters from, oh, wow, awesome. like, you know, the, like, the, like the record label that turned down U2 and the record label that turned down the Beatles. Like yeah, those, yeah. all those letters still exist. Like the, cool. like the famous one, of course, is you know, the Fred Astaire one. The I Fred Astaire audition where the guy wrote, can't sing, can't dance. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he can't sing, can't act, can dance a little. Yeah. And that turned out to be Fred Astaire. So no one knows. Yeah, you know? j- uh, on that subject, I saw it the other day. John, John Cleese has it framed in his office. The letter saying, Faulty Towers didn't like the script. Oh, yeah, that's oh, like, yeah, just, yeah. terrible. It yeah. just isn't funny. Right. Yeah. That's what they said. So, you know, and that I think, I, I actually find that tr- great solace when, because every writer goes, I think anyone in any creative field goes through this. You have that sense of like, you're not good enough and this is going to be terrible and everyone yeah. hates you. Um, you're going to lose, like the Joe Hallenbeck mantra. <laughs> and it's especially true in writing. I, when at the beginning of my career, um, I was very fortunate to um, uh, meet with and spend a day with Frank Darabont, who's a writing hero of mine. Yeah. And I told I was like, I was just getting started. I hadn't sold anything. And he very kindly, it was really weird what happened was like some, he had done The Mist, I think. And um on a message, I don't. I didn't really go on message boards anymore, but I used to back in the day. Yeah, and I was um, actually just looking to see your Neil Gaff post about uh, the Star Wars trailers. Uh, you trainer, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, like, yeah. I've basically given all. Again, it's, it's weird. You can't really be a professional and go on Neil Gaff. <laughs> like, you don't see, you know, Simon Kinberg and David Benioff <laughs> and you know Ryan Johnson hanging out on message boards very much yeah. because you kind of have to put that away when you go become a Definitely, professional. Yeah, you care. I mean, there are Aaron Sorkin used to go on and like get into flame wars with with people, <laughs> and so you know, if you more power to you. But like for me, it just became like I just, I just I, and, and again, who has the time? Yeah. Um. But so I used to be on I used to be on this film message board and and people were kind of ragging on um, The Mist. And yeah. I wrote back and said, uh, my comment was like, but this is the guy who made The Shawshank. Like, you can't really give Frank Darabont too much, even if he made a film that's not that great. Yeah. Um, this is like, you're, if you made just, made just one film that great, you're good forever. forever like, someone, yeah. like someone did a thing the other day on, on one of the websites that was, um, if you look at all, all of George Lucas, all of, all of Lucas films, other films, yeah. other than Star Wars and Indiana Jones, they're not really that great, like Willow, mm. Radio Land Murders, Red yeah. Tails. And like, there, there aren't really many other like really great films that yeah. Lucasfilm made. Okay, but I but I made the point. That's like saying, what has Jonas Salk ever done besides cure polio? <laughs> like, once you created Star Wars and Indiana Jones, you're pretty much you're right. good. For, like, that's, <laughs> yeah. you don't have to make anything. Else. You're pretty much good for the rest of your life. Yeah. You've contributed more than enough. Thank. You. And so I made the same point about the Shawshank Redemption, and then I got this weird private message from Frank Darabont saying, I don't post on that board but I do lurk and I just wanted to say I appreciated your comment thank you very much did you must have thought it was a wind up no 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 it really it, it genuinely was, was I can't remember he wrote something that I was like this is the, the real okay, guy yeah. now when you're a writer trying to break in you will jam your finger into any little crack that opens that you think. and so I wrote back saying hey I really appreciate that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an aspiring writer if you have any advice for me and he said come to my house oh, and, wow. and I'll talk to you about writing I was like this is brilliant so I went to Frank Darabont's Shit, house, man. and he was a lovely, lovely man. Yeah. And I sat with him for a bit. Um, and I remember saying to him, actually, oh, no, I can't tell you that part because that's super secret. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember saying to him, uh, talking about the terror of the blank page. Like mm. when you're trying to sit down and create something and you look at the blank page, and that's when that voice starts up. You're terrible. You can't write. Everyone's going to hate this. Yeah. You're an imposter. Everyone's going to realize that you're a fraud. And, and he said, yeah, I know. It's terrible, isn't it? And I was like, wait, hold on a minute. That, you wrote The Shawshank Redemption. He was like, yeah, it never goes away. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter what you've done. And the next script that I sit down and write, I'll go through that exact same process. You're a fraud. People are going to realize that you just got lucky that one time. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a real thing. It's called imposter syndrome. And I remember thinking, like, at the time, I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse, that even the best and most accomplished people in the industry go through it. Yeah. Or... It, that's kind of depressing to think no matter how much you accomplish you'll always be haunted by that but I actually think it's what keeps you honest the fact Definitely. that the, the, the voice that's telling you you're going to suck 
and no one's going to like this next thing. Like, I've got this book coming out. This is, I'm, I promise I'm not playing, but they have the book coming out, and I'm terribly, terribly nervous about it because what if people don't like it? And you make yourself, every time you have a film, I went through this with Eli, I went through it with After Earth, I'm sure, it'll, you know, with Star Wars down the road, like every time you contributed to something creatively, yeah. you put yourself out there and you make yourself vulnerable in a way that you don't do in any other field. And I actually came to look at my years as a critic very differently because yeah. I have a very very once you've seen how the sausage is made and how much hard work goes into the creation of something you I, I, I came to have a very different view of like how criticism works Definitely, and I have very yeah. little time for the I have, a, I have a lot of time for like informed criticism and I think that people that write good analysis of like films or games or whatever contribute something to the culture and they, they help us come to a better understanding of the medium and they help make films better and yeah. games better but I have no time at all for like the drive-by snark of the internet where people just take kind of te- ch- take cheap pot so- shots at things and yeah. move on like when people say oh I could have made a better movie than that really yeah. honestly <laughs> try it even a real even a mediocre film is really really hard to make and it's yeah. actually a minor miracle when a good film is made it's really really hard um, and so that idea that that never goes away is what keeps you honest. And I've been to writing conventions and the people that come up to me and like, oh, I've written this thing, but like, I don't know if it's any good. I'm like, you're, it, there's a good chance it is good because the fact that you've got that voice at the back of your head constantly telling you it's not good yeah. is what's making you work harder. It's when the guy comes up to you and says, I've written a script and this is the dog's bollocks and it, you don't need to change a word of it. It's the best script I've ever written. I guarantee you that script is probably crap and that guy is not going to work in the business at all because... <laughs> He doesn't have that voice. Well, it, 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 well, it, it, well, it's also just the idea that one, I guarantee once that once your script goes into the Hollywood system, it's going to get pulled apart, torn mm. apart. You're going to get 50 pages of notes. Yeah. And if you're not able to deal with that, as many writers aren't, you're not going to last five minutes in that yeah. business. So I'm still haunted by that idea of I'm terrible, I'm going to suck. But I think like, uh, if you look at writers who are, I remember Russell T. Davis, a Doctor Who guy, and most accomplished writers, when you look at um, Louis C.K., we just did a big interview about this, yeah. that everyone that you look up to, I want to be like that guy, we'll tell you the same thing. Yeah, we're all terrified of failure all the time. And that is, in fact, the thing that drives you to do your best work. Amazing. Mm. I don't know if I even, know, if I even answered the question there. I, wonder I if think such so, a tangent. No, yeah. I think that's good. One specific tip you gave to me, though, was to read unmade scripts, yeah. which I think is a really good idea mm. because I do find myself reading scripts, but because they're films you know and love, you know what's coming next, and so you're not thinking about it in those terms. Whereas I guess if you don't know, if it's something you've never read and never seen before, then yeah. you're thinking more about the structure and understanding more about what works and what doesn't. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's two ways to do it. I mean, I, um, I still need to send you that list, actually. It's uh, 25, isn't it? Yeah, so I have like 20, when people ask me, like, what would you recommend I read? Yeah. Like, because I want to be a screenwriter. Like, what books or whatever. I say, I say don't read books. Read scripts. Read, the, yeah. read the, what a good script is and you'll just hopefully through osmosis just learn what works and what doesn't yeah. and there's like a list I've got of like 20 scripts some of which have been made some of which haven't been made mm. um, oh yeah and, send that over to well, it's, it, well yeah. it's interesting to look at again you can read the script to a film that you've seen mm. and, and love and it's fascinating to look at the difference between what was on the page and then what was made but if you want to get a sense of like how a script really works, because again, a film, a, a script isn't the finished product. Mm. All it, it, it's a blueprint. It's it's meant to give you a sense of what the finished film can be. And in the course of 110, 120 pages, and as few words as possible, yeah. you have to for a director, for an actor, for all the people that are going to make the film, evoke and paint in their mind as much of a, a, a much of a picture of what the film is and can be yeah um and that's really really hard so watching a film and then reading the script is interesting but you won't the your read of the script is going to be prejudiced by the fact that you saw the film yeah. and what, whatever imagery like if you read the script to die hard that's a great script to read but you're going to see bruce willis running around in your head yeah um if you read the script like read a great unproduced script and there's a number of ones that i could recommend there's nothing for you to fall back on. Like, how, however much of the, the sense of a film, like, you, a great script you'll read, and you're like, you'll, you'll, you'll be like, I feel like I saw the movie. Yeah. But if you already saw the movie, you don't get a, a, a real way to get at that. But if you just read a great script for a film you haven't seen, and at the end of it, you're like, wow, that, that felt like watching the film, that's a great script. Okay. And those, and those are the ones that I would recommend that people read. Maybe as, a, maybe as an addendum to this, um, I'll come up with a list with some links and you can put it on the website and people can go click on links and read some that'd very unproduced scripts. Yeah, that would be, really yeah, be cool. Mm. Yeah. Great. Good stuff. Good advice there.